Wait, hang on. The red dot hasn't appeared yet. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for taking the time out to spend it with us today um, in this Green Team Kite Stories session um, called Supporting Artisans. Um, I'm Aggie. I'm the, one of the co founders of the Green Collective. And the Green Collective is a platform where we support and grow local sustainable businesses. And it's also a place where we provide uh, an avenue for them to showcase and sell their products ranging from um, bamboo straws all the way to fashion. Um, last week, we actually spoke about um, uh, the importance of craft, um, and the relevance of heritage in uh, the modern world. And this time around, we're going to be talking, getting to know a bit more about the makers behind uh, the, the products that you own. And um, while I share about who is um, with us today, uh, Peifen, can you go to the slide on the poll, please? Peifen? Okay, so we're having a poll and we would like to ask you, have you ever thought about who actually made the things that you own, be it a piece of clothing, a bag, or even the, the, the piece of um, ceramic ware that sits in your, in your kitchen? Have you ever thought about that? So please um, take the poll. If you just joined us, you can actually sign in to slido.com and key in artisans. Um, so with us today, we have uh, Hannah from uh, A Nerd Store, Stephanie from The Handmade Romantics, and uh, Yuki from Style Cat, and finally Ray from Pernema Outreach. Okay, so looking at the results here, okay majority of us have actually thought about who made um, our thing. Uh, some of you n have said no, but I think it's important to realize that um, it's um, one of the things that should connect us with our possessions because they are the people who um, weave the story into our possessions and we are the ones who actually continue it um, when we actually purchase it. Um, so, I'm going to hand over the screen or the mic to uh, <laughs> Hannah of the Nerd Store, and she'll be sharing a bit more about um, the wonderful craft of Batik. Hannah, over to Hello. you. Hello, everybody. I'm Hannah, uh, and I am one half of the Nerd Store. My partner, Tony, is also online, but today is my turn. Just going to share my screen. And... You guys see it fine? Maybe not yet. Yep. Oh, do you see the screen of the Nerd Store supporting yeah. artisans? Okay, great. So um, this is us. Um, and thank you again, Aggie, uh, for inviting us for this. This is uh, like a rare opportunity that we actually get to talk about what we do for for most of us you know like i mean it's, it's what we do but it's, it's it's not always a good time to like talk about it because there are people who think who cares right but uh it's it's great it's a great opportunity so um another store is a singapore-based uh slow fashion company that incorporates the work of indonesian batik, uh, batik artisans and textile artists we say text when we say textile art uh, we also refer to tenun and uh which is a hand woven weaving um, and and these, this is something that we that we that is forms our mission, just to preserve the traditional technique of batik as a technique and as a cultural heritage, and also a sustainable source of income for the artisans in Indonesia. We talk about the fact that a cult, an intangible cultural heritage is like a language where if you don't use it, you will lose it, right? And that's why we do what we do. And I'm sure for most of brands. Uh, today, that's that's why we do it. And uh, so a little story about the nerds. Um, this whole journey started with, with Tony, who opened a nerd gallery as a platform to connect artists and communities to learn about the culture, the technological development and historical significance of this uh, supposedly ancient textile art techniques. 
uh, of Batik and Tenun. Uh, this, of course, followed. Uh, so Tony is a chemist by trading, but uh, once he he stopped that and went to Indonesia to the different parts of Java and and actually learned how to do batik himself. And I, of course, entered into the picture as a fellow uh, enthusiast of batik. And when we nerded out, um, we actually first met uh, as fellow Indonesians uh, two Indonesian elections ago. Like quite topical, so I thought I mentioned it. <laughs> like we we're trying to encourage uh, voters to go and vote, uh, young people overseas to vote, and then and then yeah, like 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 about a good eight years later, we met on completely different circumstances, and we didn't realize that we had this shared passion, and so we formed the nut store because I want to wear the batik that he was selling. <laughs> That's the long and short of it. And then it's been, um, and of course, as when you want to make clothes, you dwell into the fashion industry and we became conscious of the waste that is generated by the industry. And then, and as we do that, we saw the opportunity to make batik better for the makers, for the wearers and for the environment. And we therefore work with textile artists, the seamstresses and the, clo the, the clothiers to help hone their skills and at the same time, systematically encourage sustainable practices in the long run. Um, I think most of the brands here will, will agree that it's not easy to change mindsets of what's current, what what uh, what appears to be currently working. So that's what we try to instill as as you know, like sustainable practices, uh, bit by bit. And so one of uh, so our, our our hashtag is I mean our, our motto is hashtag real batik nothing less. Uh, we try very best to incorporate only hand-drawn batik, uh, batik to list, which is hand-drawn or hand-stamped batik to list, um, which is also batik chap. And the reason for that is uh, twofold. One is because that is the one that incorporates the, the traditional technique that uh, supports the artisans as an income, uh, as, 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 their, uh, as their trade. And at the same time, we know that when it's batik, it will be... Um, you won't have microplastic that you have when you when you have like polyester because um, you need um, natural fibers and not synthetic fabric to in order for the dye to stick onto the fabric. That's the that's so that's you know that's, that's that's our angle, and so this is what we've done today um, to talk about what we do for slash with the makers. Um, I talked earlier about um, how batik is made, where you use the you see the first picture of the maker using the chanting to hand draw um, the design onto the fabric. You and what you'll get is like a long cloth, which is the next picture, a full cloth with uh, with, with a full design. And so Nerd has a three prong approach. The first approach is to sell it as a long cloth, and just uh, so supporting just the artisans. Uh, where we don't cut it and it's very one kind. It's another pun. We do a lot of puns. I apologize for those who get offended by puns. Don't get offended by puns. They're great. <laughs> uh, so very one kind, which is like one kind, but also one kind, one piece of cloth, right? And uh, so the, the idea is that using one piece of cloth, you can make it into different, different uh, attires. You can make it into a jumpsuit. We did this workshop before that was great with uh, at the Green Collective in our old, uh, in our old shop. Um, and, and the turnout was great because people tried to tie sarong for the first time and you're wearing it as skirts, they were wearing it as dress. And uh, and yeah, we got to wear it as a jumpsuit, which is great. And then Tony is one of the guys who are cool enough and men enough to actually wear it as a sarong and walk around. If you see him uh, during shift, that's Tony, of course, in the picture, wearing a, wearing a sarong, that's, that's Tony. Usually he's the only one who's like cool enough to walk around with it. And so when we do this, um, when, we, when, we, uh, when we do the long cloth, we, um, it's got a, the social impact is basically on artisans only, right? The, the ones who make the batik, the batik makers. And that's, that's kind of as far as the outreach goes because the cloth is ready and then we bring it here and then we try to educate uh, the, the customers and, and you know, our friends. And that's that's pretty much the outreach. So we have this little like uh, unofficial impact meter where we say uh, for this one, I guess the environment has more. Uh, there is a there is a higher um, positive impact on environment because we uh, we also install natural dye. So basically, 
uh, but but the sorry, but the social aspect is not as much because it stops there. And no textile waste, obviously, because you don't cut anything. So you, there's nothing that gets done. Uh, the challenge for this is, of course, it's not necessarily, you know, the most, uh, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to wear. Uh, we're still trying to make it cool again. Not everybody just goes like, oh, yeah, I definitely will walk into a meeting wearing a sarong. That is totally fine. Maybe we'll get there. But, uh, and, and yeah, it requires some patience from, from, from the wearer. Um, so I, sh I sh uh, there is a, p a picture of um, of mask here because I want to show you that. So the the same area that makes the the batik tulis from Lassam, that's uh, the area is called Lassam. Um, during this COVID period, they had to cut their cloth and make masks from it. So it's uh, so we were offering like hand drawn masks, uh, which were like uh, hand drawn batik that were cut as masks, and we're like. <sighs> oh no you want to cut this and make it into mass and then and but they're kind of like i mean what else could we do right like if you don't do it how are you going to survive and like fair enough then we just the only thing we can do is to honor it the the fact that and, and market it as such you know like hey um the customers are getting something great like this is you know hand-drawn batik tulis from lasam and uh so you're wearing a piece of art you know art, on your face it's like making a statement which is pretty cool and so again, back to that three-pronged approach, the second approach that we do. Um, so full transparency here, we, we do work with partners. We have a partner that does, um, that does zero waste cutting design, meaning from one piece of cloth, you form your patterns in such a way that there is a little or no, more or less no, uh, zero waste, meaning at the end of, at, at the end of it, uh, when, you, when you're done with the cloth, with, when you make a piece of clothing, uh, you don't have textile waste because you cut it um, strategically. And we also, on top of that, we also do uh, where one piece of cloth is made into like a multi-wear design. Um, meaning we still, in, we, still, uh, we still go to seamstresses, but we ask them to do very minimal things like uh, sewing the edges uh, and strategically placing buttons and button holes, uh, which are not difficult to do. So this is good when you want to uh, just employ um, seamstresses or, or clothiers who are not who are new or not not as not very highly skilled uh, sometimes they have very um, very old machines and this is this is good enough for them well okay it's good enough when you want to sew the edges uh, buttonholes not as great but you know we work with what we have and the challenge with this again is, you know, like there's limited designs that you can do this with, and um, and it works best. It works best with customers who are already buying into the the minimal zero waste efforts. Because uh, so what you see in the pictures here is, um, uh, so, so the one on the mannequin, the blue one. That's the that's that piece of cloth with buttons that you can actually wear as a as a tank top dress. But you can also like unbutton it and then wear it as a skirt. And you can also wear it, you know, like multiple ways. You can wear it as a shawl, of course. And recently I told them, hey, you guys can also use this as um, um, for mothers who are breastfeeding. You can use this as your bib, what do you call it? Yeah, the, the cover, breastfeeding cover. So that's us. And we, call, we, call, we count this as um, um, down in the middle kind of impact, uh, social, down in the middle of social and environmental uh, impact. Because again, we we use we employ uh, we, we employ handmade batik, but also we use uh, we, we employ um, uh, some seamstresses with for, for minimal for minimal words. That's us, and then last but not least, of course, um, the conventional clothes making. This is the traditional clothes making as we know it. People like to tailor their things. Uh, they, you want um, you want a good fit. You want things to be colorful and you want things to look good on you and that's completely understandable. What we try to do is using the offcuts to make them into smaller accessories uh, like headbands, drawstring pouches or like um, the cloth part of a clutch that you see here where you have a, you have a blouse that is peach in color and the clutch that goes with it. So that's basically the offcut from the blouse. Uh, the good thing about this is, of course, we get creative freedom, but the challenges are quality control, which is uh, something that I think 
most of us might have the same might, might have the same uh, might have the same uh, challenges. I think both Steph, um, Yuki, as well as where are you, Onama? <laughs> Yes, and so yes, so yeah, that, that's the kind of challenges, right? Where we are, when we are the ones facing the customers, you always want to make sure that you you represent um, the best version of the work, right? And we count this as a high social impact because we, it's a lot of work on us. And of course, I'm sure you guys were asking, where are the makers? And here is a picture of, uh, here's like a collection of their pictures. The environmental impact is not great because this is exactly part of the problems of, um, of of fashion industry, right? You create, you make a lot, you waste a lot. Um, but we're trying, we're trying to slowly get, you know, to both. And uh, and of course, in the the environment, the, sorry, the social impact is great because every step of the way, a nerd pays. <laughs> like you have to like first, you got to pay for the cloth, or like we're we're one of the one of the silly people who actually buy the cloth and then buy, I mean, the, pay for the services to make them into clothes uh, because there are different makers around the area. So we'll, so what we'll do is we'll, you know, we, we pay for it to be made into clothes and then we pay for it to be made into the accessories and so on and so forth. And it is great at, for income generation perspective because we don't just, it's not the same people who makes the clothes. Uh, so there are, there are seamstresses who only like to make uh, clothes, for instance, for instance, there are some which are not great at, um, not great yet, or like not not there yet. Um, there's this gentleman who's holding the "I made your clothes" sign, who apparently only likes to cut and then passes the work on to his friend. But you know, that's like I, I do that too with Tony sometimes. And um, and yeah, I guess we're proud to say that. Um, one of our seamstresses, we, we discovered this like very, very recently that, uh, I think we talked about her about a year ago. Um, and she was like kind of in a dire condition a little bit. I'm not keen to share the picture because you know, it was like basically it's a picture of her house where it's like, well, she was kind of in debt and, um, she had really old sewing machines and we were like, um, okay, so what do you need? You know, how can we help? Like, let's, can we, can we buy you a sewing machine or like, you know, kind of, uh, Put it on loan, and we did that. And then one year later, um, that's her at the uh, Miss Norhayati at the bottom right of the picture. She's um, she's she's a team of three now, no longer just one, um, no longer just one. And she's um, she's she, she can now feed like her children who are three and six year old each. And yeah, and the best part is, what was the best part? What's my train of thought? Sorry. And, and well yeah and, and the best part is that I guess like you know the fact that we we, we are continuing we are continuously giving her giving her uh, giving her income giving her job to, to, to do and I think she's very grateful for that and so yes I think that's all I have Oh, thank you, Hannah. That's very interesting. I mean, I'm uh, I'm actually very curious. Just one question is that you mentioned a lot about sustainability being part of the the process um, with your makers. How how receptive have they been? Because you mentioned natural dyes and the zero pattern, um, zero waste pattern cutting as well. Have they been very receptive to that? Um, I mean, since the beginning. Typically, when you pay for it, they will do it. <laughs> so, like, okay, so we, we do we, we pay a little bit more for for this process of uh, natural dye, right? I think uh, Aggie, you'll be familiar because it's you have to dip dye the first time, and then you gotta hang it to dry for a little while, and then basically the, the cloth will end up taking a couple of days, like on a good weather good weather week, it will take a couple of days, could be a couple of weeks in order to. Right. Be complete, right? Um, but you just you just pay a little bit more for that, and then um, and we try to average out the costs. Uh, we talked about this before, where uh, we try to average out the price so that that is not too high, and then the 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 hand stem ones is also not too cheap, so that you kind of even out. But right. yeah, they yeah. But that aside, I think the the makers are are I mean they're, they're happy with it because you see like they're happy that that we are embarking on this uh, like like efforts right because. Um, I think you're from, uh, since some of us might be familiar that there is the most polluted river, uh, allegedly in the world that, um, 
that that has uh, mostly come uh, that is most mostly polluted by textile waste. Um, so Tony and I think that it's not just from batik. Uh, I think batik just forms a small percentage of it. But be that as it may, you know, it's still it's still a waste, right? And and so what happens since is because in in certain areas like Pakalongan, uh, for instance, where batik is like the main source of uh, main activities. Hi Karen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> where batik is like the main activity. Uh, so what they'll do is they uh, the the government itself will come up with with certain um, measures to collect the waste mm. where it's not natural dye. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, and and to, to dispose of it safely. For natural okay. dye, you can throw it out. Uh, like, it's it's not think- a yeah, I think Stephanie would probably have some input on this. Um, let's go over to Stephanie from the Henry Romantics. So she's also part of the Green Collective, and her um, she does she's involved a bit in the hand stamp boutique. So let's hear a bit from from her. Hannah, could you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through my materials um, just to give a heads up. I haven't actually gone into batik too much because I think uh, that was covered quite a bit. Um, but I will go through some of my products that has uh, hand stamp batik as well. So my slides aren't as nice as Hannah's. They're quite um, randomly put together. So apologies for that. Um, I just want to give a quick background to the brand. So the Handmade Romantics is... Uh, just a very small brand that I started out uh, when I was having a career break um, with really just the aim of supporting small-scale artisans. I think people, especially maybe those who felt a bit disconnected with um, the society, feel like maybe they want to contribute a little bit more through um, various endeavors. So mine was really to look into how I can support small-scale artisans or independent artisans. Um, And I started the journey really by going to... um, craft fairs and also going to like random remote villages in Indonesia where I'm from also um, to really explore the crafts that each village has. So normally in Indonesia, each village has a different specialization. Um, So I really just spent uh, some time exploring the area, meeting people and craftsmen that I could work with. Uh, And then along the way, I met a lot of people that, um, you know, I admired their work ethics, that I admired the way they um, they took pride in their in their crafts and that's how I ended up with my first set of artisans. Um, so when I first started I had a quite a big variety of products um, and I still do in the stockists uh, just like the Green Collective. Um, so there's been a lot of trial and error trying to find a craftsman that are reliable and can deliver the kind of quality that customers in the market like Singapore are looking for. Um, but right now we've sort of uh, zoomed in on uh, working with uh, batik artisans who do hand stamp batik, as Hannah mentioned. Uh, we also work with, for example, shoe craftsmen um, and also uh, various sort of home accessories uh, that I'll go through in a bit more details. One more product that I will cover in the presentation is also um, our anti shake bags, which is our woven bags. Um, that's been quite popular as a replacement for um, taking plastic bags in the supermarkets, for example. So I just want to walk you through as well how we get to that stage, a couple of videos around how the process is done. Um, yeah, so just... Uh, yeah, so we work with a variety of artisan models. Some of them are independent, some of them are artisan collectives, some scale, some, some are small scale enterprises. Um, and the reason why we don't work with anything that's large scale of factories is because I think going back to the aim, uh, we realize that everyone sort of is, is uh, a lot of what people's lives are determined by the circumstances that they're born in. So by working with smaller scale players in the market, we just hope to be able to, to, to equalize the society a little bit. And also from the impact on customer, the whole aim is to really uh, provide a bit of a fashionable option and alternative to the fast fashion uh, choices that you see right now in the shops. So kind of going back to the poll earlier in, in, the, in the call is, is um, to give people uh, an option to shop more consciously and think about the makers that they are impacting when they make a purchase. So on this slide, um, I, as I mentioned, I will go through into the history of how or our details into how batik chap is made. Uh, we also use batik chap a bit like nerd. Um, we don't use batik tulip. Batik tulip is purely because um, 
the price range is a little bit high for us and we haven't i i'm only a one-man person so i don't really have the the capacity to to man on, on both ranges um but um, i still choose to use um in most of the apparel and the shoes that i make um batik chap uh, to hannah's point i think that's one of the traditional methods that still supports the artisans that we work with it's not being done by by factories um so it still honors the human touch and the human element about it uh about uh the about batik process. So these are some of the batik chap um, stamps that we have. So you can see how that uh, those stamps actually translate to the products that we have on the screen. Um, you can see the arrow. So sorry, Pavan, just the previous slide. Yeah. So the the blue dress is actually made by stamping repeatedly on the piece of fabric. Um, the stem that's right above it. So you can see the patterns actually match. And then the one that's right on the right hand side um, are the stems for the skirt that you see on the screen there. Um, so what they do is they repeatedly use uh, dip these stems in ink and then kind of make their way across the, the fabric. So it is quite time consuming. It, it requires a lot of concentration. Um, and this is also why it's a bit more expensive uh, than the factory printed batik. So you're really paying for, for the human work and, and the human touch that goes into this. So we use the batik uh, chat fabric for not just apparel, but also for the shoes that we work with. Yeah, thank you. So for the shoes, uh, we actually have a couple of pictures here. Um, just to walk you through how it normally works. So normally a shoe workshop, and this is super traditional, so you don't really see the kind of fancy machinery you see in, in shoe factories. Um, it's normally made up of sort of five to seven uh, shoe craftsmen. They're normally middle-aged men that have been honing their craft for quite a number of years. Um, and, and to Hannah's point as well, the tasks are normally sort of split up. So we have uh, someone who's in charge of cutting the fabric, someone who's in charge of stamping the label. So the picture that you see on the left here is actually the, um, the shoe mold. Um, so they have different size molds for different size shoes um, and what they do is they trace the mold onto a thin, a thin piece of cardboard sort of thing um, and then they cut out the cardboard onto the shape, onto the shape of the shoes. They then use um, glue to then stick the fabric to create the base of the shoe and then also to create that to uh, stick that to the rubber to create the sole. Um, and then they often then use a small blade that you can see on the top middle picture there to essentially cut away the excess material um, to really fit the shape of the shoe and, and create that perfect fit. Um, so yeah, they use a lot of very traditional materials. They use things like hammer, they use things like small knives. Um, and then the machine that you see right in the bottom right corner is actually the stamping machine. So it's super old school. I really liked it when I saw it. Um, it's basically where they put... Um, uh, the label paper through uh, and then at the top there they put a stamp that uh, that shows the logo of, of your brand and essentially they will then stamp make repeatedly make stamps onto the paper and that paper then gets transferred onto the actual shoe itself and that creates the logo that you see um, when you buy our shoes in gold. Um, so yeah, so that's really the kind of very sort of traditional old school uh, machineries that they use. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, but part of what we try to impart to them as well is kind of moving away from that old school thinking to maybe the more modern mindset um, is on the sustainability aspect. So a lot of the fabrics that they would normally throw away from cutting away the excess, um, we're actually collecting it. Um, it's obviously a very small effort in terms of the wider sustainability sustainability scale, uh, but we try to essentially then collect all of the excess material um, and then ship that to another facility to, to create um, smaller items or explore what we can do with it. So to your point about changing mindset, Aggie, it, it's, um, for us, it's not always straightforward. I think a lot of times they just forget <laughs> to collect the fabric because it's just, it's just not in their way of working. It's a bit like when you, when you go to a bubble tea store and you tell them you don't want straws, but they still give you straws because they're used to doing it. Um, it's, it's sort of the same mentality, right? They haven't, they're doing through, they're going through things so quickly. They don't really think about um, doing things differently from what they used before. So sometimes it, it is seen as a bit of an extra effort and we have to go through that, that sort of lesson um, often and, and continuously with them before they get used to the idea. Uh, but they do see the point of it. I think it's just that when you are busy and when you are struggling to put food on the table, that that sustainability isn't always on the forefront of everyone's mind. So that's just what we try to advocate with our artisans. Yeah, so just to give you a quick view as well of our products. Um, as I mentioned, I use uh, batik fabric for apparel and shoes. 
Um, so you can see here, this has, these are some of the transformations that we've done from, uh, from raw fabric to shoes and, and apparel. Um, so a lot of the apparel that we do as well is, is one size, um, partly is because it's easier for me to just track the logistics of, but also um, for customers that, uh, we essentially try to make one size fits for all. I think it creates less waste from our end as well so that we don't have to, um, we're not stuck with uh, multiple pieces of a particular size. I think, especially with new materials like this, there's always a bit of trial and error in the market as well, in the customer market. So we can't always um, project exactly how things are going to sell. And um, you might have heard about how, you know, brands like H&M, Gucci were, were essentially um, burning their leftover stock because there's a lot of leftover that's not being sold. Obviously, we're nowhere near the scale of them, but we don't want to be um, stuck in the same situation where we are left with uh, stock that we have created. But essentially, we're trying to, to be sustainable, but we can't, uh, we can't essentially get rid of the stock. So that's why a lot of the times we try to have things uh, one size um, and fits all. Yep, so that's the, that's the fabric element. Um, and then for the next few slides, I just want to show you how we make a couple of our home accessories and also our um, anti-chic bags. These two are actually videos, so I don't know if you can play them, Payfin. Um, yeah. so if you just click on like the, um, the grandma with the pink, <laughs> the pink uh, <laughs> dress. If you, uh, okay, maybe you have to play it on there. I actually tried it yesterday and it was fine. I can't seem to play it. There are pictures. Okay, um, let me yeah. just probably share my screen. Okay. Sorry for that. Uh, I think you might need to stop presenting first, Payfin. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Um, not yet, maybe it's taking some time to load. Sorry, my internet's been acting up <laughs> the whole week, so hopefully this will not be a problem. Can you see it? Yeah, yep, you can see it now. Okay, cool, I'm gonna try to do this in presentation mode, so hope that works. Uh... Yeah, so before I go into further details, um, these are essentially videos of uh, these grandmas that I found <clears throat> when I was going around the villages in one of the small towns in, near Java, um, in Java. Um, so what they do is they operate these hand-operated um, um, loom machines and they create, uh, you know, the, the grandma that you saw just now, she was creating um, uh, fabric uh, rags for the kitchen. Um, and then the grandma on the right hand side here is uh, she's essentially taking these raw materials that you see the pink color ones um, to then. So these are essentially weeds that have been sort of cut, dried and then cut into small strips. And then they've essentially then also dyed into this color. And what they do is they will then put um, use this looming machine to weave the, uh, the weeds together to create some sort of like the dining set that you can see at the bottom here. So this is something that I also um, have in my stock at the Green Collective. Um, but this is essentially made out of uh, purely all natural wheat that has been dyed and and and, and weaved together by this machine. Um, so I just want to show you. Steph, for, sorry, are you sharing a video? Um, I'm sharing the slide and on the slide uh, there is the video. Can every, did everyone see that? Yeah, I saw the video, yeah, just now, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, you can still see, you can still see my screen, right? Yes, we can still yes. see your screen. Okay. Cool. Sorry, technical problems. Um, yeah. So, so I just want to show you another video where um, she's essentially weaving um, this raw material that's the pink color here into some sort of dining set that you can see on the bottom here. 
I hope that's that place. Um, I don't know if you can see. So she is, she essentially has a tube that contains all the strips of the wheat and she puts them through one by one of the machine and then essentially that uses a thread to bind the the weeds together to create the dining set. Um, yeah, so, so a lot of the, I just want to put some faces to the artisans that we work with. A lot of them are really just very simple sort of um, traditional craftsmen. They've been doing this for years and you can see as well in the first video earlier how, how simple the workshop looks. Um, so it's nothing fancy, but I hope you can see that by your purchase, you're actually supporting um, this sort of traditional artisans that are just trying to uh, use their traditional crafts to create an income. Yeah, so um, that was one of the uh, videos that I have. And then I also want to show um, a video of uh, our artisans creating the anti-chic bags. So these are the anti-chic bags that you've probably seen in store or, or on our web store, and they've been quite popular. A lot of people use it um, either to go to the gym or uh, go to the supermarket and and not take plastic bags. So they're actually made from uh, plastic st plastic strips from recycled waste, um, and so they're very durable, very sturdy, and also waterproof. So it's quite uh, quite multifunctional. And I just want to show you um, the technique that they use to um, to weave it. So obviously this has been fast forwarded, but essentially it's um, it's quite. Uh, it's quite skillful and normally they can complete one bag, I think in about 30 minutes. Um, so the ladies who do this side of work, they're normally housewives or girls who have just finished school. Um, they are based at home. So a lot of the time this, this sort of work can be done um, from the comfort of their homes. And the reason why we actually like working with these ladies is because it, it gives them the ability to earn a bit of money um, while also still taking care of the kids. Because a lot of the times uh, their husbands uh, are also away for work. Uh, some of them go away from their villages to find work in Jakarta. Um, so uh, we can't have both parents being away from, from the children, obviously. So this is why we, we like supporting the, um, the women artisans to be able to take care of their family, but also be able to contribute to the household income. Uh, so I think the, the, the most that they have earned so far from the women that I've spoken to, they've been able to supplement their household income up to 15%. Um, and given the fact that, especially in villages like this, um, a lot of the um, household responsibilities are borne by the children when they've become adults. So they will even help subsidize for um, the parents' expenses or even their siblings' education. Um, so I feel like a little goes a long way. Um, even if they only supplement 15% of the household income, it helps alleviate that burden from, from their elderly parents. And then in the last video, I just want to show you how uh, we get from the raw materials to, to the strips here. Uh, just let me try to play that. So essentially the plastic comes in rolls and what they do is they try to separate them um, into the desired amount. I think it's about 75 uh, strips per bag, depending on the size. And they, they, they run it through this loom machine. Again, it's hand operated, so not, nothing fancy like in the factory. Um, they run it through the loom machine here and that essentially separates the amount that they need for each bag. They then use um, like a knife to cut through um, to cut through the loop here uh, and then use that to, to weave the bag that you can see in the video. Yeah, so the bag comes in various sizes and we've been having customers uh, come in to use it for, you know, everything from picnic to, to their school bag because it's quite sturdy. They can also hold a laptop um, or even to just uh, for your household chores, like going to the supermarket and stuff. So, yeah, so um, I think that's all that uh, I have for the slides today. Apologies for the technical errors. Um, but yeah, if Thank there's you. any questions, let me know. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. Um, yeah, I mean, just looking at the the slides that you have, the the process seems to be very in, labor intensive. And someone was actually asking on on Slido just now, is there any way to automate it and make it more efficient? And why choose artisan when 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 the when the market is actually going um, towards you know um, machinery industrialization? And perhaps maybe uh, Yuki could also pitch in when you. Uh, when you share later on yeah yeah i think why we choose to work for artisans i think 
we recognize the importance of technology and obviously we as consumers or modern age consumers anyway we enjoy having everything sort of automated everything easy but i think in a way that's a little bit unfair for the artisan communities that haven't got the capacity or the resources to to automate um, I mean, I'm going to be really honest, I haven't got the resources to help them buy a fully automated machinery either and, and then to be able to then uh, supervise them for the use and the quality. So that's probably why, you know, I think while technology is convenient, I think we also probably should spare a thought to um, maybe members of the community who haven't got the the ability to, to move to that next stage. Um, I think in the long run, if we can, we want to be able to to introduce them to, to new to more technology, uh, maybe moving from a hand loom to like a hand machine. Um, so in the seamstress house that we have, for example, they're using uh, they're using sewing machines, uh, still hand operated, but it's still a lot easier than the traditional loom machines. So we do have um, plans to do that in the future, uh, but to be honest, it's a slow process and we're still learning as well. But in the meantime, we don't want to leave behind the people that aren't quite there yet. Mm, I think it's a good time to actually introduce um, Yuki from Star, uh, Style Cat because she's also um, involved with communities that do hand looming and weaving. So Yuki, can you share a bit more about your makers? Okay, so hello everybody, good evening. Uh, my name is Yuki Higson and let me just try to... Okay, is, do you guys see that? Okay, so again, thank you for um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I just want to tell you about our brand story. So my, I handle the brand Style Cat, and we do um, bags, accessories, swimwear, all handmade um, by artisans from the Philippines. So just to tell you about you know how we even started, how we how Style Cat started. It's actually a three year old brand, but I've been into you know making things and selling things since I was 15 years old. So the first, you know, what made me start it was actually back in 2007, funny enough, uh, when I was 15 and we were made to clean up a bay here in the Philippines. And with that simple experience, with that two hour school activity, we, I actually realized, you know, like there's so much styro and there's so much trash and there's so much, there's so much excess, right? So that's when I started upcycling things. So my first brand is called We Garage and we had this in 2008. So it's all about upcycling um, fabric, uh, like game pieces, bottle caps. So um, that's how it all started. But when it, when it all started like um, more than 10 years ago, I really, what, tied me to the brand and what tied me to entrepreneurship was actually the idea of helping a community. That's what I love the most. I love that, you know, we could provide possibly livelihood for these people, for these mom, for, for the moms who can work from home. I really love that idea. And that's what made me um, be more inspired to keep going with the brand. Funny enough, um, the uh, the brand Style Cat was actually born three years ago because my husband, then boyfriend at that time, he was like, you know, you should start something. And I'm like, no, I don't want, I think that's a past already. I don't want to do the upcycling thing anymore. And he goes, no, just, you know, just start something and I'll support you. So that's actually why we started Style Cat. And he was based in Singapore back then. So our first home for our products was, was actually in Haji Lane because he lived across Haji Lane. And these baskets that you see on the screen, these are actually hand woven by artisans from the Philippines, like similar to Hannah and Stephanie. These moms work from home. And I'm not sure if you guys have been, but in the Philippines, the skill of weaving is, you know, it's, it's very common. And whichever province you go to, whichever community, most likely they will know how to weave from their mats, their baskets, the roofs they have um, in their homes. So, so this particular style of weaving is very popular in the Philippines. So when I started the, the brand Style Cat, I instantly found a lot of communities who could offer and who we could collaborate with to create these products. So this is actually like one of our first pieces. And just a background on our weavers and about our artisans, they literally make everything end to end. So what I mean is 
from the banana fiber. They strip it into these abaca strips. They're the ones who dye it. They cook it in a big calderon, like what you see on the image on the right. And what amazes me is how, like, how this simple technique, how this simple skill can be something appreciated in different countries, how we can export this to, to, to different resorts. So that's what really amazed me when I saw the products of the communities I met. And these are this is these are one of, um one of our weavers from Laguna. So Laguna is a town far from Metro Manila, far from the center. And you can just imagine how rural it is. And to meet them, um, people always ask me, "How do you meet your artisans? How do you meet your communities?" You actually have to go, you know, go from town to town. Um, I do sourcing trips. I go to the wet markets just to find them and. It always excites me because sometimes I can't believe that they make these products using their bare hands. And it's just amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a video to play, but as you can see, one of our artisans really just start with uh, strip um, leaves. These are pandan leaves. And that's how she makes a bag. And this is one, this is um, the clutch on the right is, is a bag we made for Brow House. So, you know, like a global brand actually also wants to support artisans and they really they really love it like the finish the sturdiness of the bag um similar to stephanie's artisans earlier we also have um, a lot of hand loomers from the philippines and these are our fabric weavers from northern luzon what i love about this is it's it's a very like algorithmic machine it looks very traditional and they use their hands and the and the feet but it's actually very well calculated so what amazes me is you know they thought of this generation generations ago and they pass it on to their kids and they just create beautiful yards of fabric so if you can see on the left side she actually has um a roll of thread that actually goes under as as the mechanism goes so th that's how they make the fabric and the, and the uh, the and the product is really nice so how we use it we like to modernize it and make it versatile so this one um the hand loom fabric we make it into head wraps which is one of our best sellers we even make it into bags and i like what hannah mentioned earlier you know like the tradition, the craftsmanship, it's like a language, you know, if you don't speak it, it's gonna die. So our main goal is to always have projects for them, to provide livelihood for them, and of course, to keep it relevant. Um, I really want to incorporate and collaborate with them and make their products that they have been doing for generations and generations into something very modern, stylish, so yeah, so, so that, that's our goal with StyleCat. And one of the communities we work with, also in the Philippines, are persons deprived of liberty. So we have male and female PDLs that we work with. And um, these people have the skill. When I went to the compound, um, when I first met them, they said, you know, we, we have a problem. Like we have all these products but we're not making any sales we're not making any money and when i saw it it was so beautiful like these beaded bags you'd see in zara or top shop and i'm like how could you not make any sales and you know it so what what i did was i just took the skill that they already had um and just changed the shapes the silhouettes the color pairing and we were able to make these beautiful beaded bags. And then when they see it on the model, they're so surprised, they're so amazed. And for me, that reaction is very priceless. So that's why I really love working with different communities. I mean, sometimes it's very tempting to source somewhere else because it's cheaper. But seeing these reactions, hearing the feedback from the artisans, make me very, you know, it, it gives me a sense of fulfillment. And we really um, were grateful that they're very open to learning as well. You know, when we, 
when we go to them and say, oh, let's do this design, let's do this print, they're super open, which I really appreciate. And what we do is, you know, from end to end, down to our packaging, it's also made by the community. So remember the photo earlier, back in 2007, um, the moms in that picture, we actually still work with them now. So they can't weave, they can't do the beading, but they do our packaging. So these moms do it while watching the kids from the house, just on watching TV. And they, it, it's a really um, fruitful collaboration for StyleCat and the communities that work, we work with. That's why I'm super happy and, you know, we're, for me, like working with artisans from the Philippines is such a breeze. And yeah, because they're like the creative ones also who suggest, who suggest the designs. So there. There you go. So that's all about my Thank brand. You. And I try to keep it that's as tight as possible. Um, you work with so many communities. Yeah. Right, but I, I really love how the fact, the fact that you actually take something very traditional and make it modern so that it's um, people are more receptive to, to the idea of having something that's made by an artisan. And you touched on upcycling and then actually reminds me that um, Ray from Pranama Outreach, um, you're involved with communities that um, upcycle. I think if, if I'm not mistaken, it's is it? Tires? Yes, Maybe you can share a bit more about that. Yes, thank you. Um, before I move to the upcycling, I think um, we're in the last five minutes in the hour. You hear the same theme that's about handmade, supporting local. And I think in here is about building our community and the culture of the craftsmanship that we bring in the modern designs for urban wear. So I'm so happy to be in this community. So yes, um, we are a social enterprise based in Singapore. I'm Ray and uh, the co-founder and also the lead designer for Pranama Outreach. So Pranama is a slow fashion brand and a cycle solutions provider, like Aggie was mentioning. We do upskilling and education outreach programs um, in the region, which is Nepal, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines as well. So our products are both, are both eco-friendly and have a social impact. So you'll hear a bit more about that. Um, so we started first in Nepal. So in Nepal, it's about skill development program and it's focusing on women in terms of the skill development program. Because these are the women that have a lot of struggles, um, hardship in the past. So we bring them in into this two year skill development program using traditional methods and processes in creating handmade products, such as uh, in the slides that you see, they're doing the, um, the dyeing process just similar to what Yuki was saying, but in fact, they're doing it in a bucket if they don't have the wooden loom primitive type of um, dyeing process that they do in the mountains. So sometimes they bring in the city using a bucket and they would sort and, and they would hang it dry and they would sort those threads like you see in slides. We have that on. And as well as they use just simple old wooden loom that looks like it's complex but yet they come up with amazing products such as this that you're seeing this is all using natural dye and all the uniqueness of the pattern is done just by simply putting all the threads on the loom so that's the amazing thing that they do um, you could find this at the green collective at finan mall and if we go to um, the next slide which is the upcycling processes. And you can see uh, the- um, Can you share race slides? So if you look at the next slide, and it's, it's fine if you don't have it. And the necklace that I'm wearing is made of upcycled tire inner tube. So it's completely hand cut. So how we're helping this community of artisans is the more you order, just like all the three um, guests that you have here, the more you shop and shop for good the more artisans that we could place at the job place. And this is what we do. So these are the things that we also do. And one of the things too is this bag tags that can replace plastic. So one of the things that we work with the community in Indonesia, I think you've heard two other guests that's working with Indonesia on Batik, but this is on the upcycle tire inner tube because we're avid scuba divers. And when we went in, scuba diving with loving the life underwater. We noticed that the life underwater is degrading. 
So I do a lot of sketching. So when I sketch it, do all these different sketches, I start thinking, what can we do to create a product to limit the use of single use plastics where possible? And to also eliminate the use of leather where PETA certified, uh, vegan certified. So with that, I start thinking of tire inner tube. So this is what we use to create the tire inner tube as accessories and fashion products. And another thing that we upcycle um, as we work through with the artisans, they have the same value system as us, which is uh, looking into sourcing locally and environmentally friendly products. So with that, we look at single use plastic bags. How do you use single use plastic bags or reuse them, repurpose them into something fashionable? So what we do is we look at how do we weave that? So using the weaving processes, we weave it with organic cotton threads and make that as different designs, such as this clutch. And the, the items that's underneath this, this, this clutch that makes it stays is also something that we repurpose. So we're giving second life to a lot of the products that's out there. So and in minimizing waste in the same time. So we talk about, I think Hannah was talking about minimizing waste. How do you minimize waste? How do you educate in minimizing waste? We actually weigh our material that goes in and to the output, how much do we have left in the fabric? How much do we have left as new material that's coming in? So those are the things that we do. Um, how do we work with artisans in this? Is It's definitely a community of artisans that we bring their, they bring their uniqueness in learning how to weave, for example, the Nepalese, or in Indonesia, they already know how to weave, and we educate them more about the fashion industry, the post-production waste, and using uh, natural dye processes, things like that. And we bring modern fashion designs with that. So what comes out of it is a sustainable happiness. I think that's, that's one of the things that we do. Thank you, Ray. Um, there was one question that came up um, and uh, they're asking, do you have a criteria that you, um, when it comes to selecting the artisans to work with and do you decide on like what proportion of them should be women? Um, I do have a criteria. The criteria is basically a, um, I, I wouldn't say the word I because my partner and I, Charles, uh, what we do is we interview them, um, whether or not they do uh, go through a social impact in what they do. Um, what impact are they making? Similar to, almost um, similar to what the Green Collective does, right? You look at UN SDG. We look at what are you doing for the community? Are you here just to make a profit? If someone is trying to just buy this bamboo straws for us, from us, let's say, then we ask them, who are you helping? Are you helping the farmers? Or are you just cutting down some bamboo trees and creating this bamboo straws, straws for mass production? So there's a lot of things that they have to carry our value system. Our mission statement has to be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important. I mean, it's something that um, we value a lot at the Green Collective as well. Um, I think we'll take some final um, comments from everyone on the panel before we go on to our on our uh, go on to our quiz. And there was one question here that I feel is uh, very relevant, especially when we're all well, not we're not all under lockdown, but especially in the Philippines, we're in, under lockdown now. Um, what what has the how has the livelihood of your makers been impacted by COVID? Um, maybe Ray, you can start first. Yeah, um, I shared this on the last one too. Definitely, they're heavily impacted. Uh, we're a social enterprise, so the more orders you give us out there, the more work they have, and the more new design. Even though we're a slow fashion, we keep it at minimum. It's definitely impacting them. Um, so a lot of our makers, for example, in Indonesia, they have to cut down their staff. Okay. And another maker had to completely find another job elsewhere as a full-time job. They cannot live based on what they have. What we do is we support them by creating new design, giving them work, keeping that active in their mindset. Um, and in Nepal, 
they've gone through three months already of lockdown and they their workshop is not yet open so their community is actually starving okay. so they're eating like beaten rice so what we did is we pivot our efforts and we sell our products when we have our products proceeds the proceeds is not just directly impacting the women in that skill development program which also impacting the, their children to school instead we purchase food supplies so there were about two, three weeks ago we supported um 20 over 20 plus families for food supplies for a month which costs only us dollars 25 for a month for one family so we had to do some rearrangement and pivot that and one of the things that we're doing also is we start I'm starting to do a lot of my drawing, my sketches. It's like, okay, once you're open, here are the list of items that you can start immediately. So to get them on their feet. So again, it's about supporting the community. It's about sustainability. It's using the traditional methods and keeping that within the community and the craftsmanship is part of the culture and ways and to bring the modern design that we do from Pranama being not just a fashion and design company, but really supporting them as a social enterprise as well. Right. What about you, Yuki? Um, I mean, you're in the Philippines, you're, you're not out of lockdown yet. Okay, hello? Yes. Yeah. Um, so here in the Philippines, it's been, it's been tricky because of course, oh, we're, we're still not out of lockdown yet, but um, we're thankful that we, we made a system that the moms work from home. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been thankful. We, what we just did, like what Ray mentioned, is we um, just tweaked it and like say for the women who used to do packaging, of course, we don't need them to make any packaging soon, right? But we made them do a lot of ear savers. Um, also for our artisans who do the hand blooming products instead of making bags, we started to do um, head wraps, you know, for Zoom. So thankfully, that one partnered with corporate accounts we found are helping sustain them. Because at the start, people were telling us, you know, you have to plan B, you have to live with it, fashion's going to be silent. And it scares you, right? That's, that's super scary. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we're, we've been thankful that, you know, like we've been pushing heavily online as well here in the Philippines. And... So far, I mean, I, we've been lucky that, you know, the sales and um, the projects for artisans are still continuing. So hopefully um, it bounces back, but, you know, it doesn't slide back. But yeah, it, it's been okay. Okay. And uh, finally, Stephanie, any last words? Because you've been, been pretty active in um, with your campaign for your makers. Um, yeah, so... We've actually just wrapped up the campaign. Um, it, we started a, a crowdfunding slash fundraising campaign that actually quite a few brands in in the Green Collective has been helping. So Nerd has been part of it. Um, Shop Style Cat as well has spent quite a lot of time with us brainstorming. Um, essentially, we tried to save uh, to raise money for uh, medical equipments in uh, hospitals in Indonesia, especially those outside of Jakarta. Um, the idea behind that again is that we cannot reach everyone that of the makers that are affected by the crisis, um, but we try to at least make sure that the if they ever need medical assistance, then there is proper equipment and proper assistance that they can turn to. Um, so we have actually managed to raise um, five thousand dollars, which I know in the grand scheme of things does not seem a lot, um, but I think when we're talking to uh, the, the charity they're working with in Jakarta, they've managed to, uh, I think, get 10 boxes of equipment, uh, various things like gloves, uh, masks, uh, some, uh, some of the hazmat suits as well for the doctors. Um, there has been a rise in the number of medical deaths in, in Indonesia. So these are the kind of things that we are hoping to just uh, help the makers uh, indirectly for their medical assistance, if, even if we can't help them with our purchases right now. Work. Um, I think I'll just wrap it up here. Um, but before we leave, um, Pifeng, do you, can you actually put up the quiz, please? So we're having a quiz. Um, there is a question. And basically, it's fastest fingers first. 
whoever can, um, the two, there'll be two winners and you'll get to win um, a $10 voucher, which you can use on our online platform, um, the greencollective.sg. We have an online platform there. Um, uh, and we're also at Funan. So um, you just have to type your answer in the chat and the two fastest people will get the voucher. Okay, uh, Pifan, next slide, please. <laughs> yes, the question. Oh, wow, was, very fast. <laughs> you got. I didn't even get time to read the question. <laughs> okay, um, so the winners are Nicolette and Inna. So if you could just um, pass your details to Payfan, um, and then we'll get back to you with the voucher via email. Thank you so much for taking part. And thank you to our panelists, um, Stephanie from The Handmade, Mar Handmade Romantics, Yuki from Style Cat, yeah. uh, Ray from Panama Outreach, and Hannah and Tony from A Note Store. You can find them at The Green Collective um, on and also at our online platform, thegreencollective.sg. Um, next Thursday, we'll also be having a webinar session, our Kampong chat, which will be on sustainable skincare. So do look out for our um, Facebook event um, on Facebook, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. And Una to stay back for a while.